Okay, uh, thanks everyone. So today I'm going to uh, show some uh, what we have done during the last few years of moving AMRPG2 to cloud, also about trying to build a high performance uh, cloud so that you can run your uh, HPC jobs in the cloud uh, platforms. So, and also I will show some demo at the end of the presentation. So these days, cloud computing has been uh, becoming a very important platforms in both industry uh, environment and also uh, in the HPC for HPC workloads. So these days, the, the virtual machine or container, this type of technologies, uh, is kind of key technologies to enabling people to run their workloads in the cloud environments. And the important thing is, uh, the, for example, the IDC or Gartner, they have been uh, for, uh, forecasting that the public cloud spending will be will be around like $200 billion by the, uh, 2020. So we can, assume, we, can, we can expect that so many workloads will run over there. Okay, so if you are not familiar with uh, fertilizer technologies, I just want to briefly uh, introduce what kind of uh, technologies actually is there in the cloud computing platforms. There are broadly people trying to use two kind of technologies there. First one is hypervisor-based fertilization, basically uh, you can think like a virtual machine, those, those kind of environment. So in, with virtual machine, you are able to uh, have very higher level of isolation and you can, you can support multiple different versions or different kind of uh, operating systems. Let's say you can, if you, some user wants to run Red, uh, Red Heart, uh, uh, Linux or uh, Windows or Ubuntu, they can uh, efficiently run on top of the same host. And the other kind of uh, fertilizer technology, which is called a container-based solution. So, for example, in the right side figure shows, uh, you can run the, your uh, uh, a container instance on top of the same uh, Linux kernel, let's say uh, this host Linux OS, and then there's a Docker engine on top of it, and then you can run different uh, instances on top of it. So basically, all these instances will share the whole the same kernel, but all the dependencies will be, the dep dependent libraries will be separate. For example, these are scat stacks, depends on some libraries. This one depends on some other libraries. They can be uh, encapsulated very uh, quickly in the, so, you, so that you can run your jobs efficiently on the, uh, on the HPC cloud environment. So, uh, obviously, as we can see, that container-based solution looks like uh, lightweight, more lightweight than the virtual machine-based solution because uh, there's no, like, uh, uh, this hypervisor layer and the, uh, uh, those kind of things. So container-based virtualization has, has been uh, picked up, I think, these days. No matter what kind of uh, virtualization technology you are trying to use in your cloud environment, one important thing is if you want to run your HPC job efficiently, you have to have or you have to support efficient, advanced hardware in your cloud uh, environment. These days, if you look at the, all these kind of advanced features available in modern hardware is that you need to efficiently utilize multiple and medical technologies like accelerators, CPU, GPU, KNL, and uh, large memory nodes, SSD and VME or uh, cloud storage systems. And uh, one, two more important things about the RDMA-based uh, infinity band networks over Rocky. And uh, then the, uh, another one uh, important thing is single root IO fertilization. So in many of the cloud environment, actually these days have been supporting these two technologies uh, uh, for example, in the Amazon EC2, you are able to run SRV-based virtual machine, and also you are able to access their uh, infinity band or GPGPU, those kind of uh, uh, high-performance hardware. And the incoming cloud, with, which is NSF-supported cloud environment, you are actually also able to uh, utilize SRV-enabled infinity band instances. So, so for some of you who is not familiar with uh, uh, about infinity, uh, SRV, I just want to quickly introduce what is uh, what is that. So basically, like this figure shows, you have this, if you have SRV uh, supported hardware, let's say InfiniBand, uh, traditionally you have one uh, NIC or one HCA uh, set up in your uh, node. With the SRV, you are able to represent yourself like a multiple for two functions or for two device available in the, uh, in the PCA bus. And then with the SRV, uh, you are able to assign each of these for two functions to a dedicated for two machine. For example, you have multiple for two machines running on top of the hypervisor. Uh, in order to use this uh, if, uh, if it or SRV device efficiently, you're able to, you actually can dedicatedly mapping one virtual function to one guest. So just like this. And then this virtual fun for, for this virtual machine is like that I, I actually own this uh, device and use it directly, okay? 
So in that way, your driver, you don't have to change. So we, you can use the default InfiniBand driver you can directly run with the SRV InfiniBand device. So this kind of uh, capability are actually already supported by uh, high-performance internet as well as, as, well as InfiniBand. This has been uh, showing very good performance. For example, if, for some of you, for some of some of you, you're familiar with uh, like a traditional way of networking virtualization. They are trying to use front end, back end driver, like split driver model, so that each uh, packet transfer needs to go through different uh, drivers, and so and the different layers. The performance is really bad compared with SRV. So that's why these days SRV has been uh, emerging in for, for building HPC cloud. The other thing is, like I said earlier, so uh, in Philippines and the high performance Ethernet, how they are available in the cloud, they are able to give you very low latency, like a few microseconds, and high bandwidth, like up to 200 Gbps, and the low virtualization, those kind of features. Now the question is how to build HPC cloud with both SRV and the Infinity Band and deliver the optimal performance, especially near to native performance. That's the major goal of uh, our uh, MRPH uh, uh, world this library. Okay, I just want to list uh, some of the uh, broad challenges here. So, in order to like bring your attention of what kind of, uh, of uh, like challenges of, of designing efficient communication I/O library on top of HPC cloud. So, let's say for different virtualization uh, technologies, you are able, you should be able to support, for example, KVN, uh, Docker, Singularity, all these things. And then for the for the uh, like I said, for HPC cloud, you have different now you have different kind of communication channels or communication mechanisms like SRV, inter inter virtual, mach uh, virtual machine shared memory, and IPC shared memory CMA like uh, uh, or LIMIC like uh, Dr. Jing also mentioned. And uh, it, another important thing is after you run your uh, workloads or or you run your applications in HPC cloud because now you have a virtual machine layer or container layer, now the topology or those kind of th information becomes different. Uh, then you run your uh, jobs on top of a uh, native environment. So in that case, how you can detect the locality, the process of locality, process of location of, and also virtual machine location so that you can, you're able to schedule your uh, communication efficiently. And the more, not, more, not, not only this, and something like a new, mal uh, new malware communication and the migration support, because these days, when you, when you talk about cloud, the, first, the migration uh, capability is kind of a requirement. It's kind of demand it's because uh, if you want to give the elasticity or flexibility to your workloads, you are able to. You should be able to support the virtual machine migration, okay? And uh, some other things like co-design with resource manage management in the cloud, like OpenStack, Snur, this type of um, uh, framework. So in our group, we ha we actually uh, explore different approaches to be, uh, build the HPC cloud. I uh, will introduce some of uh, this one by one. So for some of you now already know, like IMRP2 has, has been there for like 15 years. So from uh, 2000, 2015, we, ha we actually released our IMRP2 world. Okay. Now the VM and the container aware design actually is already available in our uh, public IMRP2 world version. Uh, some of the other features which I introduced today will be uh, released soon also. So this is the IMRP2 family. So today I will focus on IMRP2 world which is high performance and scalable MPI for hypervisor and container-based uh, HPC cloud environment. So this, fi this figure just to show that, okay, what kind of uh, uh, challenges has, has been addressed by our team so far. So let's say this is your HPC big data middleware. Uh, we can run with a different HPC uh, uh, library or program model. And this is the resource management or schedule assistance uh, available in HPC cloud, like OpenStack or uh, Snurn. And then we actually majorly focus on this layer, like communication in the I library, which uh, to support the high performance HPC and the big data workloads. So first of all, let's uh, look at the first approach. Uh, we call it like a MRPG2 world with SRV and IVCMAN, okay? So this one will fo mo majorly focus on these components. So the MPI runtime, we actually design some locality aware communication schemes, and it will work with I've main channel, CMA channel, SRV channel, and uh, we are this 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 design can run uh, in a standalone manner, or it can also run with OpenStack. So before I introduce this, let's first give some uh, like a background or motivation of this work, uh, the, the early the, our motivation of doing this work. So if you look at this figure, so if you deploy two fort machines, okay, in your in one host, if you run the uh, native or or default. Uh, uh, Perfs tests, we run IB, IB sentence or IB read or IB write. 
And then we also in, uh, enabled IVGM in KVM, and then we, we developed the same benchmark to check what kind of performance correctness is actually. What do we see that? If you see the latency, let's just say for uh, six four, uh, 64 bytes message size with SRV, IB send, and Avishman, we can see that Avishman actually is able to give you much better performance, right? This is like a 40, 40 or 50 times difference compared with the SRV channel. Now, with this actually, then this give, you us, they give us some idea, like can, whether we can design, bring something like Avishman, this kind of high performance communication channel into the MPI library so that MPI runtime can utilize it and then is able to give you much better performance than uh, default SRV channel. So what, what kind of things we, can, we should do in our MPI library? With this actually in, the, uh, in 2014, uh, that we actually pu published two papers. We are uh, trying to design the Avishman uh, and SRV aware MPI library. So basically the idea is kind of uh, we know SRV can give you like a near native performance if you do internal communication, okay? But for internal communication, if we know that these two VMs actually co-located in the same host, then can we use IVCMN channel? Okay, that's actually is very uh, important in terms of performance. So that what we did is we enabled IVCMN channel in, t in the first machine and then we uh, developed some locality aware detect detector inside the MAPS2 library. So that each time when the API uh, job launched, we will, we, we will set some kind of flag in the efficient region so that we can detect the old, uh, like process topology information in the cloud environment. So in that case, we know okay, which process is running which VM and whether this VM is same host or not. So that we can do, we can do the uh, co communication coordination due, uh, based on this locality information. Uh, with this, with this, this is one important thing. Second important thing is, if we run these things in the OpenStack based cloud, actually how to deploy those virtual machines is out of your MPI library controls, right? So in that way, we, we have another idea is whether we can extend the current OpenStack uh, component. They say currently in OpenStack, the major important component called Nova, which is, uh, in, uh, which is responsible for uh, locating virtual machines for the users, okay? So we extend the Nova, we are able to support SRV configuration, supporting average configuration, and uh, so that when they're allocated for two machines, all these things will set up automatically for the users. So we have to publish a paper in Cisco Read uh, about, about these more details. Now let's take a look at the numbers uh, with this design. So for example, first, first, this first set of numbers is about internal interfere uh, point point performance, okay? So the green bar is, a uh, green line is the default one. So you run your default MAPH2 with SRV scheme. So it can run, there's no problem for running it. But the problem if you look at the performance, it's actually not as good as the native, environment, native performance. Native means you run MPI job in the uh, native host. But with our proposed design, we actually can bring the performance very close to the native curve. Okay, you, you only see like around 3% or 8% performance difference. This is for the latency. Similarly for bandwidth, we are able to see uh, improve like 158%. And the, the, the uh, overhead is, or, or is also less than 10%. That's the uh, micro benchmark. If you look at the application, similarly, uh, the proposed design, for example, for large speed class, we are able to uh, reduce the like, uh, execution time up about 40% for loss IS, uh, IS this benchmark. And then this is P3 DFAT uh, for different kind of uh, uh, different kind of uh, benchmarks, we are able to show uh, around 20 to 30 per percent improvement compared with default. So this graph 100 and spec, uh, similarly, we are able to like uh, just uh, from 1% to 10% performance overhead compared with the native. Okay, so this is the first thing. We are just trying to show that with our mob 2 virtual library, if you run your HPC application on top of virtual machine based uh, HPC cloud, you are able to get Near to native performance, okay? It's much better than you run before the MRP2 with your application HPC cloud environment. This is the uh, major information I want to share with you. The second, second important thing is like I mentioned earlier, now you have SRV device, you have Avishman device. The problem is whether you can migrate your virtual machine. Okay, so for this part, I will cover this, uh, this box, basically how to do virtual machine uh, migration support in MPI runtime. 
And uh, also we have a survey channel. We have, we have designed some migration uh, controller with this uh, uh, SRV enabled infinite network. First of all, let's just give you like a, a feeling of why this problem is important. So maybe, maybe many of you think Fortune Machine has been there for like how many years? 1960, right? The, the first IBM system bring Fortune Machine uh, technology is like almost half the, uh, multiple decades. The live migration already supported and many people mention of that, right? Why, why do still, we still want to do some research here? Actually, yes, for, for traditional environment, for example, if you, have, if you use the default power of uh, fertilization or use the Ethernet based fertilization, you're able to migrate it, there's no problem. But the problem is if you, with the emerging SRV technology and the infinity band, if you're trying to do live migration with virtual machine, it will be in immediately fail. The, the KVN, the KVN uh, hypervisor will tell you that, okay, currently, uh, sorry, I cannot migrate your virtual machine because you have some device which cannot support that. So this, have become, this, have become, this definitely become a very uh, big blocker of using our library or any SRV-based solutions on HPC Cloud, right? Now the question is how to handle this. So before we do, some re before we do our research, we actually did a lot of survey first. We also doubt whether this is something new or, we, or, or is already solved by some uh, other researchers. So we did extensive survey, did some work available in the literature or a community. So different people have different solutions for different platforms, let's say Ethernet or Infinity, even InfiniBand, for Intel solutions, Mailock solutions, or Huawei solutions. Yes, there's some solutions, but the problem is if you look, at in, look into these solutions, we found there are some limitations, and also it does limit, it does lim, limitation is very important. If you look at their solutions, we, di we divide it into different uh, categories. For example, if, whether you need to modify guest OS, whether you need to modify the device driver, whether you, you, you need to modify the hypervisor. We see that all of them needs to do something in some way, okay? Either you ha they have to change something inside the guest OS or they need to change something in drive device driver or they have to change something in hypervisor. What does this mean? This means none of these solutions can run independently with the guest OS version hypervisor version and the device driver or device vendor, even device, uh, the different types of device. So this will significantly limit the adoption of these technologies because there are so many HP centers, that each HP center or each HPC cluster, HPC cloud have different environments, different setup. How you can assume that this kind of modification available for you, right? Okay, so now the biggest challenge is actually is this. Can we design some approach which is hypervisor independent and device driver independent, which means you don't have to change anything in hypervisor, you don't have to change anything in device, so that you can support your virtual machine with MP application migration on top of HPC Cloud. This is the major goal, okay? This seems impossible, but actually we did it with our MPI library. So the idea is that, so let's say this is your uh, uh, InfiniBand cluster or uh, InfiniBand, SRV InfiniBand based HPC cloud. You run your MPI jobs in inside different virtual machines, okay? You have the SRV channel, like I mentioned. You also have the IFSHMAN channel, channel, I also mentioned our, uh, in the pre previous work. Now the question is how to do migration in this infrastructure. So with this, we proposed uh, another uh, important component called uh, we called uh, parallel uh, migration con uh, controller framework. So basically, the idea of that, we want to like uh, handle the migration signal properly by our framework. Okay, rather than use a hypervisor command, we first use we also trying to get all these signals and maintain these signals by ourselves. This one important thing. Second important thing is how to trigger or notify the MPI runtime. Currently, the user is trying to do migration or not, or whether the migration is done or not. So this signal is very important for, uh, for MPI job to do migration. So another important thing is if for, the, for the MPI runtime, we should be able to uh, like uh, shut down or suspend our IP connections, and then after migration, we, we should be able to reestablish the connections again. And then we are able to uh, transfer the message um, after the channel gets reestablished. So we proposed these two different schemes. One is we did these things in Progress Engine. 
Another thing is we propose another dedicated migrant strategy inside MPI runtime. So we call it a PE and MT based approach. We want to see that which approach is better for what kind of workloads. So we actually published paper in IPTBS 2017. We just published uh, present this paper there. So now let's take a look at uh, how this works. So this is the uh, component I just introduced. OK, this is sequence. So first thing, let's see these different phases. The first phase is the, the user is trying to say that I want to migrate this virtual machine from this node to uh, from this, this virtual machine from this node to this node. Okay, then we ask them to use our network suspend trigger to do this. So basically this, this one will issue the VM migration request and then it, this one actually implemented on top of an MPI, uh, uh, MPI uh, startup channel so that it can uh, quickly launch this uh, or quickly issue these comments to all the nodes. This is phase one. And then once this one, once this the first, uh, migration signal get triggered, then the first, uh, we will give we will write some signal into the uh, first average man rating so that the MPI runtime can detect that, saying that okay, I know user is trying to migrate me. And then the first machine will do inside the first machine the MPI runtime will try to suspend their uh, communication channel, and then after that done, done it will it will set it will write some flag into the average average man rating again, saying that okay, I'm ready to migrate. And then we have, outside we have the ready to migrate detector, which will practically uh, detect the status of uh, internal MPI runtime. So that we, we know, okay, if the MPI runtime is ready, so that we, are, we, we should be able to uh, call the, we, we should be able to uh, uh, carry out the first uh, VM mic live migration operation. But before that, we still need to do uh, two more things. We should first detach the SRV driver SRV device and also an uh, efficient device so that this dependency or this kind of limitation for uh, VM migration will be able to get re uh, resolved. And then after that, uh, the actual VM live migration will happen. Okay, the mi migra this one, the first machine will migrate from here to uh, here, this node. And then after that, the uh, migration de down detector will also get the signal that okay, internally this uh, migration has, has been done. And then it's trying to set up, reset up the Irishman uh, as well as the SRV device. And also the, uh, after that, the network reactive notif notifier, this component, will write the signal into the MPI runtime again, saying that, okay, now you're, you, sh you, should be re you should be okay to uh, reestablish your connection. So with that, the MPI runtime will reestablish the IP connection for the, uh, uh, with the migrated virtual machine. And then after that, the complication can continue. So this is the way of how the uh, migration happens with our proposed solution. So with this, actually, if you see, we don't have to depend on any hypervisor. We don't have to depend on any driver or uh, devices. Now let's take a look how efficient of this approach. So we, we actually uh, evaluated with our approach with different, uh, different protocols of doing migration. We can migrate with TCP IP over Ethernet, or we, we, we can also migrate with IP over, over IP with InfiniBand. We can also migrate with RDMA-based uh, page transfer uh, mechanism. So with this, we see that RDMA-based uh, migration scheme definitely can reduce the total migration time by 20%, uh, uh, if, if you see this breakdown time. And also, if you look at our uh, parallel migration framework itself, if we compare it with some sequential based sequ sequential migration framework, we are able to reduce time reduce time to uh, around 50 percent. So this also shows that the migration becomes very efficient with our solution. So this is the migration performance. But if you look into the benchmark performance, if you run some like uh, OCU latency or this OCU, la yeah, OCU latency inside the uh, virtual machine and they use different schemes to migrate the virtual machine. You, if you compare, compare these different schemes, we see that actually uh, definitely RDMA-based schemes still better than IP over IP. And the MT-based design, like I mentioned, we have dedicated migration thread, compared with the Procos engine-based design, we actually see there's a similar performance. The main reason is because the mi migration thread-based design currently, because in this, in this benchmark, there's only complication, this OSU benchmark, right? There's not too much uh, opportunity for you to do the overlapping. With migrant, with migrant service design, the main idea is trying to bring the opportunity of doing mig, uh, overlapping. So the next slide actually show this slide actually show how much overlapping you can get uh, when you when you choose uh, 
MT-based migration. So for example, the, the red line is when you run uh, some benchmark, which is no migration. This is the this ideal case performance. And uh, with PE-based design, you actually there's no chance for you to do my, to do the overlapping because any, any, every time you have to you have to wait until the migration is done and then you resume your work. But for MT based design, like I said earlier, we have a dedicated thread which which can uh, prepare the migration stuff in the background. Okay, so as long as you don't, y y as long as when you do migration, you have enough competition there, the whole migration time can be overlapped fully. So in this way, you actually can uh, achieve very good overlapping. For example, around 10% of the computation partition uh, com uh, migration time could be overlapped. Around 30 or 30% or 40%. Uh, this much of uh, competition ratio, you are able to fully overlap the uh, migration time. And uh, this, the, the next one is, that's, those are benchmark results. Now let's take a look at the uh, results with applications. This we run the uh, North benchmark and also Graph 500. As we can see that uh, our, our solution, like an MT-based solution, with very close performance with no migration. So basically, which means even you perform the migration during your, MP, uh, during your job runtime, we actually can achieve similar performance as the normal uh, run. For example, normal run means you don't do any migration. So in this way, we are able to fully overlapping, fully overlapping the migration overhead with our uh, MPA uh, communication and the migration uh, thread. So this is the second, second thing we, uh, we did for uh, MRP2 Word. The third thing is actually uh, very important these days because many people are trying to use container environment in their HPC cloud. So there are two important uh, solutions available in the community. One is Docker, the other one is Singularity. So with this, we actually trying to address this box. So still uh, different channels, and then we are trying to discuss about Docker and the Singularity. So first of all, what kind of problems there? I also still want to give you some background or motivation of this work. If you look at this graph, so for, for, example, for example, for us, we also have the same, same question. Many people say that container is already very lightweight. It can give you nearly the performance by default. Why you need to do some new designs? Right? That's an important question we have to answer in the beginning, okay, before you do anything. Okay, so we asked our students to try some work, uh, to do some performance evaluation first. So this is the result uh, uh, earlier we, we get. For example, you run, you run OSU micromanage mark, you compare it with like a VM pass-through, VM SRV, container pass-through, and, and the native environment. We see that, yes, container-based solution looks like it's very close to native already. Okay, then what else we can do? It's already very close, right? This is this for Docker. Then, so this is interesting. So then we, 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 said, we, we were trying to see, okay, whether something we can do with application layer. So we did some evaluation. This is graph 100. We run with a native environment, 60, 60 process, and with, this is one bar. Second bar is one container in, the, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in that uh, host, also 16 process. We see that the performance is very similar. Host is 65, and then container is 65.5. There's 0.5 overhead or degradation. There's nothing much. And then we continue. We say whether we, if you run multiple containers, what happens? It turns out the opportunity comes. Or the challenge comes, you can think in that way also. When you run two containers, the time increases to 178. If you're, when you run four containers, it, it goes to 252. Okay, what's, the, what's, wrong with, what's wrong with the container? Okay, so this is our, our very earlier results. And then we did some breakdown on this, on this graph. We see that actually the competition time is not changing too much. The communication time gets increased a lot, but why? So we did some further, uh, sort of further profiling. Actually, we, what we see that because in traditional MPI environment or native environment, native environment, we actually efficiently utilize CMA, shared memory, HCA channels uh, for different message size or uh, extra. And then when we run on top of container, what we found is the CMA channel is not pick up, picked up properly. The reason is because in container environment, by default, especially for Docker, by default, your lame space is isolated which means that you cannot see PID of the destination process. If you cannot see PID, then your CMA cannot work, right? So that's the major, major motivation of this work. 
And then with that, actually, we, we are trying to enable the PID, uh, lane space sharing, and also locality de detection, all, all those things inside the container environment for our MPI library. Then we actually see, see good performance improvement. Okay. The left one actually is container for intra socket and inter socket case. No matter which case, we are able to improve performance around 80%. So which means if you don't do anything, you run, with, you run your application with Docker, then you will lose 80% of the performance. That's unacceptable, right? Nobody will run this type of, will run this type of things on HPC Cloud. And then if you look at the performance for collective, we compare with default one and the native, we are able to improve performance like significantly, like almost say 90%. And the comparison native, we are almost similar. So in this way, you are able to achieve high performance in the cloud environment. In this way, you are able to run your application on the cloud. So this is something, uh, other information with the NAS and the graph handler. Similarly, we are able to, uh, uh, only, we only see, uh, for example, for, the, for, for this case, the native and the, and, the, and the optimized one is very similar. And then we, with increasing number of containers, we are able to bring down the performance back to the regular case. Because earlier, do you remember the story I mentioned earlier? This was the performance if you run your job uh, in the default Docker environment. So this is for the uh, Docker. For Singularity, we are able to see a similar uh, kind of uh, performance, performance numbers. We see that less than 10%, uh, I'm sorry, eight, around 8% or 3% performance uh, difference between uh, Singularity environment and the native environment. This is collective, 80% to 9%, and then this some application, this cl uh, MPP class D and this graph under, almost uh, uh, seven or 6% difference. Very, very close. Okay, so this is about the container. Now the next story is actually is very interesting. Uh, the reason is, the reason, uh, the next story is about nested virtualization, okay? It will cover the components, in this way, okay? So this kind of components there, and then we have nested virtualization, and then uh, go through this path. Now let's take a look, what is the nested virtualization? Or like what kind of background or motivation of doing this work? Every time what you first need know what, why we are trying to do this, and what we did, and how much performance benefit you can see at the end. So this is the, this is the, this is the picture to show what is nested virtualization, okay? So for example, think about Amazon or any public cloud. They give you what? They give you a virtual machine, right? Then you, what you get is this kind of box. You have different virtual machines from the cloud resource provider. VM1, VM2, this is what you have. And then for some case, for, for many cases, not some cases, for many cases these days, people trying to wrap their, or encapsulate their application inside container instance or in container images. And then when you launch your job, actually your job is running inside the containers. And then, but your, your resource, whatever you get from public cloud services, actually is a virtual machine. So basically it means you are running your application inside the container, then inside virtual machine. That's, we call it nested virtualization environment. Is this, pos is this popular or is this like common case? The answer is yes. This is like a typical scenario of, of uh, nested virtualization. Think about the, some developer, for example, like uh, some application developer, they develop some, some applications and then they want to distribute their application to more users. So typically these days what they can do is they wrap or they put their applications and also the, all the necessary in de uh, dependent libraries into the Docker instance or Singularity instance and then we push it to the Docker re uh, registry service. So that when other users they log into some cloud environment, they say uh, Amazon or Microsoft Azure, they will check whether some application I can uh, directly pull down from the Docker uh, public ser uh, application service or application market to run their uh, cloud environment. Yes, maybe you find some applications we are, you are trying to run, and then you you actually do the uh, in, in the virtual machine, you're actually trying to download those uh, Docker images or similarity images and then run it on top of the virtual machine environment. So in that case, you actually run, you're exactly run in the nested virtualization environment. So that's why, that's why we think the nested virtualization will be a normal or, reg or co very common case in the, in the next generation cloud environment. Okay, with this, what kind of challenges or what kind of uh, 
difficult, uh, what kind of uh, opportunities we have to design efficient uh, communication IO runtime. So if you look at this figure, for example, you have this, the, this same host, and then you have two new nodes, and then you deploy your virtual machine, bind to this new this virtual machine bind to this new and then you run different containers, a uh, number of containers, different virtual machines. So with this, if you look at the co how many communication paths available in this environment, actually it's, it's a lot. For example, you can do communication between core four to core five, this inter-VM, inter-container communication across uh, core four to core five. And then for pass two, you probably will do inter-VM, but inter-container communication, which actually communicated from core 13 to core 14, this, this pass, four, pass two. For path three, you actually communicate between container one to con container two, which means you con you, your communication will go through inter-VM and inter-container. There's another pass which from this container to, the, to the, some other container in the other node, which is actually like inter-node, inter-VM, inter-container communication. There are many, many paths which you have to take care of it. So this is the uh, important, um, very important things you have to keep in mind when you uh, schedule your MPI communication or any other uh, communication library in the nested virtualized environment. Now some people may, may say, okay, you're, earlier you have proposed some locality level design in container environment, whether this can be used in nested virtualized environment or not. So before we do, any, before we do work, we just uh, evaluate that solution first. What we see is, yes, it, it helped a little compared with if you run default, but compared with native, it still has a lot of overhead, which means the one layer based design, one layer means if you're only aware of container layer, which course one layer. Okay, the one layer design still have a lot of opportunities for us to improve further. Then the challenge is, like I said, how to further reduce those performance degradation, especially for the applications. And then what kind of impacts of different VM and the container placement schemes for the communication? Because now you have VM, you have containers, they may bind to different sockets, different cores. Whether you are able to uh, design new malware, uh, like uh, communication schemes inside the MPI library in the nested virtualized environment. So this is what we did in the uh, VE 2017 paper uh, we published this year. So basically, we are trying to bring two layer locality de detection. So first layer is how about what kind of topology information of the virtual machine. And the second layer is how, what kind of uh, topology locality information of the containers. So with that, we combine these two layer information and then we are able to know, okay, what kind of uh, locality information exactly uh, of your MPI jobs. And then we also have propose some new malware uh, communication coordin coordinator so that we know, okay, if, if you communicate with this guy, whether they're in the same new malware, new, new mal, what kind of uh, uh, paths we should choose. With this, we, are, we actually can show fairly good performance improvement. For example, compared to one, one layer design, we are able to deliver almost 84% and 184% performance improvement for both latency and bandwidth. This is significant improvement. The second thing is, uh, for, we also propose some other hybrid design uh, for, because of time, we, I don't want to go to detail. The best, that, that means the best scheme we, we propose in the, in the paper, which can give you like a 42% improvement and 25% improvement respectively. And then for applications like graph under and, and the loss, we also see like a, or, uh, 13, uh, 16% and 12% improvement for different cases. So this is for less virtualization. Another story is about uh, resource management. Here, uh, we are covering these components, uh, like especially for the SNR and the OpenStack. Here, the story is different. Because we, whatever I proposed earlier is only about how to enhance MPI runtime or we design some tools to, uh, to coordinate uh, communication and to coordinate the uh, migration. Now the problem is, typically what user trying to run their HPC uh, jobs with SNR, this type of uh, uh, scheduler, resource scheduler or resource manager. So typically you have three uh, scenarios. The first one we call the exclusive allocation sequential jobs. Basically you get the nodes exclusively and then run your jobs one by one. This is a very common case, right? This is in HPC environment. Another, another case is we call exclusive allocation but concurrent jobs. Basically you have the, all the nodes allocated for you, just for you. 
but you run your job, your multiple application, uh, applications simultaneously. And then in this case, if you run VMs with it, you have to uh, handle the isolation properly. For example, which VM we use, which version function, and then which IFHMN region should be used for which job. You cannot, you should isolate that properly. Another thing is more, imp more important is shared allocations and the concurrent jobs. This is more for HPC Cloud. So the reason is because for HPC Cloud, the main reason of resource sharing. That's why you bring fertilization, right? So with that, which means different users may, sh may share the allocation, may share the hosts to run their fertile machines on top of it and then run their jobs in the uh, fertile machines. So in this case, the isolation and security becomes more important. You have to isolate all these device uh, resources more uh, flexibility and efficiently. Now the, the, the problem is that if you want to do this type of isolation or resource management, MPI library alone cannot do it because you, for MPI library, you only know, okay, what I'm doing for the job the user just launched. I cannot handle, I cannot take care of anything rather than that because I cannot control the allocations for the other user's job, right? So MPI becomes, MPI alone becomes impossible to manage these resources. We have to do something with SNRN. We have to ex extend SNRN to make SNRN to support managing SRV and IFHMN devices. So if you look at the SNRN architecture, this is your SNRN control D daemon and the SNRN daemon in the each node. And then we extend SNRN to uh, manage virtual machines first. When you submit a job, you just write some requirements, uh, descri describe your requirements of virtual machines, how many virtual machines you want, how many cores, what kind, how, how large of memory you want in the virtual machine configuring file. And then we will submit a job to the SNR. And then in SNR, we will, uh, we will get the physical node list and then we will launch VMs on these physical nodes. And then here, we will uh, call the libvirtd to allocate, uh, to, to, to launch the VMs. Basically the steps including uh, SRV device selection, and IFHMN device allocation and configuration, network setting, image management, launching VMs, and the check availability, and mount the global file system, those kind of things. And then you just, just like this. And then after that, we are let, let the, let the uh, uh, SNR know, okay, this environment is ready. You can launch your M MPI jobs on top of virtual machines. So this is something we, uh, we did. There, there's multiple ways of doing, uh, extended SNR of, do, uh, of doing these uh, jobs. One way is you can de design something like uh, uh, scripts. You can put some scripts inside your s batch uh, file so that you can deploy your virtual machine by yourself. But th there's some limitation of that because for some steps you may need root permission uh, or privilege, per privilege per uh, permission. With that actually is not secure. But with SNRM, actually in some context you already have that. So that's why we actually trying to uh, extend SNRN with Spunk plugin architecture. Spunk plugin architecture is a standard way of extending SNRN functionality. So the idea is that we will, uh, we will bring three components. The first one is VM configuration reader, which will pass your uh, VM configura configuration requirements and, then and, and then register this information into the environment. So that when we launch VMs, we, we can get all this information. And then when, uh, when we uh, submit jobs, the VM the VM launcher will be getting loaded and then it will try to deploy the virtual machine. And after the jobs run, the v, uh, VM reclaimer will, will tear down the VMs and reclaim the resources. So this is one thing. The second thing is, I think some of these steps, like, like how to manage VM, how to launch those things, actually already did by OpenStack. Then we have some ideas that if in some environment, people have both SNR and OpenStack, whether they can work together. Actually it's possible because we, in this case, we are able to offload all the VM management functionalities to OpenStack demons. OpenStack will do a better job than us, I believe, because they have so, many, so much effort did there, right? So with that, we are able to launch the VMs also more scalable than uh, if we did in, uh, in uh, because the OpenStack already highly optimized for, for those things. But two important things I want to mention is that we actually also utilize the extension earlier we proposed for uh, OpenStack new uh, Nova component, like PCI whitelist and, uh, and IFHMN device management. So with this, we trying to like uh, evaluate with all three different schemes, like I mentioned, uh, scenarios like I mentioned earlier, uh, ex exclusive allocations to credit jobs or shared host allocation, concurrent jobs, or exclusive allocation and concurrent jobs. We are trying to see that with different kind of allocations, 
and the resource sharing uh, schemes, what kind of performance we can achieve. Actually, with all these schemes, we are, we are able to uh, we are able to achieve very good performance, close to native, like only four per, four per, four percent, or uh, something like that. Uh, difference compared with the native environment. Okay, so all what I talked here looks like you have changed this, this, and that. And it's become so so difficult, and it's, especially if you want to deploy virtual machine, container, everything together. It's become so difficult to you to use it, right? But the good news is actually, the good news is that we develop some appliance, which also public available in the uh, company cloud. Actually, this is what we are, I, I were trying to show in my, uh, in my demo. So these two appliances actually can help you. With one click, you are able to deploy whatever I, I just talked in cloud. Just one click, just, and then you just go and wait. Get a coffee and come back. The environment is ready for you to run in PHO. So currently, uh, we have multiple appliances are, uh, available. For example, we have the basic SRE plus KVM. So with that, you can, you can, you can play with it. Uh, there is no MPI, but you can run, if you want to try with SRV and uh, Infinity Band, we have, we have set up, up everything for you. You are able to try that. That's the basic appliance. On top of that, we also, de we also developed the MRPG2 World Library. Uh, we have MRPG2 Library for bare metal cluster and then we have a library with virtual agent support for SRV enabled uh, KVM uh, clusters. And then uh, on the other front, we also have the RDMA Hadoop based uh, appliance already. So if you want to run some uh, big data jobs, you, you also can use the Hadoop appliance. So basically what these appliances do is, this appliance is based on uh, OpenStack heat. So heat is uh, OpenStack orchestration service. So basically, you're trying to define the workflow of your application. So HIT will automatically orchestrate all the resources for you. For example, how to allocate the virtual network, virtual machine, and then, uh, and then make them work together. So, so in our HIT uh, uh, template, basically we will, long, we will load the VM creation, allocate ports from Neutron, which is the uh, OpenStack network management uh, component, allocate the floating IP, generate SSK, those kind of things. And then after that, you just go and run your MPI job. So with that, let me quickly give a demo. So uh, just first to give some screen, short, uh, screen, uh, uh, screen sh uh, sharing so that you can uh, like, uh, know high level steps. First log in to the chameleon, and then you will see that okay, there's some uh, list, you need to create a list. When you create a list, you need to mention that you have the infinity band, you have to have infinity band support, you have to indicate infinity band support so that it will allocate some infinity band nodes to you. And then with that, you can, uh, with this list, you, you are able to uh, start your experiments. For example, you can uh, choose this MPI up appliance. And then in this portal, you can get the appliance uh, template. Copy this URL, which we will use later. You don't have to uh, look at the details of the, what, what, what's going on here. And then you go to the stack portal, create a stack, and use that link put here. And then the portal will automatically pass that uh, template and then ask some kind of uh, configurations. You can mention how many nodes you want, those kind of things. And then you, you, can, uh, you can say what kind of, what needs you, want, you are trying to use, because I, tell, I told you earlier, right, we, uh, you have to reserve some nodes. And then after that, just click. And then this stack will uh, automatically deploy it for you. Uh, this is the details of the stack. After that, you are able to, uh, log, once the, once the uh, nodes are available, you should be able to log in and, and run. That's for the uh, bare metal. For KVM one, similarly, uh, you just choose different appliance. This is a KVM uh, cluster appliance. And then get the appliance uh, templates and then, and then set, up, give some, uh, set up some values like how many virtual machines, each virtual machine, how many virtual cores, uh, what, what's the memory size, those kind of things. And then launch it. Once this one, once this one becomes re uh, running, you should be able to log in. Then you can run MPI jobs uh, inside the virtual machine. This is the floating IP. This is a public IP you can use to uh, log into these nodes. So for example, this is the IP address. If you log in there, you will see exactly like a, you, you, you log into some HPC cluster. You're, this is the MPI uh, appliance. Appli this is the MPI instance zero uh, node. This is MPI instance one. And then this hello world, you can combine it and then you run it. And then this is the, this is the output. And then you can run also run OSU microbenchmark. This is latency and the bandwidth. With that, I can give you like a quick real demo. 
so that you know uh, what kind of things you can you can run exactly. So if you go to the go to this web page, so this MPA, MPA SRV KVN cluster, this is the appliance I just mentioned. If you go to this this link, get a template, this is the link. Okay? Actually this template is generic enough, you can run any other MPA uh, library as well. So this is the details, we don't have to look at into it, just, just copy this one, copy this one, and then log in to the uh, Chameleon Cloud. So this is the Chameleon Cloud portal. Okay, so like I mentioned, you first you go to the list to reserve some, to reserve some nodes, okay? So this is the details. One important thing is you need to select the Infinity Band support. They also have a GPU, storage, FPGA, Xeon, Atom, and ARM. So different nodes are available. So if you want to try that, also, also, also good. So but, but for our appliance, you should select the Infinity Band support. And then if you do create, it will create someone. I already created one called the demo. So this is the list I created. So these are details of the list. And then after that, once you get the list, go to orchestration, click stacks, okay? And then here you can, uh, you can, you can launch stack. So here you can, uh, this is a template source. Earlier I copied a URL, right? That's the appliance URL, whatever we developed earlier. So you put the appliance, you put the URL here, here, and then say next. The system will automatically pass that template and then, and then show you the, uh, all the, all the required field you should input. For example, let's say, uh, how, how much, what's the memory size for each VM? We, we, we can say 4GB, <coughs> and then what's the uh, list ID? We can choose demo. How many nodes you want, for example, they say two. How many virtual machines you want for, uh, we can say four maybe, so that each uh, node has, uh, has, four, has two virtual machines. And then you can say four, CP, four CPUs for each virtual machine. And then if you say launch, actually we already created one. Uh, launch, uh, you, it will create this stack for you. This is the, if you click it, this is the detail of that stack. This is the resources you actually uh, uh, allocated. And then if you go to compute, uh, go to instances, you will see that how many nodes actually uh, launched with this stack. For example, we launched MPI instance zero and MPI instance one. There's one input, like, like I mentioned earlier, you, you have the, because we are, we are automatically assigned a floating IP, which is a public IP for you. And then you copy this IP address, open any terminal. The default user name is CC. Chameleon Cloud, okay? So put the IP address, log in there. See, I don't have to write any password. The reason is because when you, when you uh, allocate this stack or this uh, instances, you already select your uh, SS key. It will automatically uh, set up SS, SS key for you. So when you log in it, you should be able to see uh, some, some files over there. There's one important file is a VMIP mapping. This file, this will tell you the IP address and host lane of uh, the virtual machines launched in this uh, bare metal nodes. Let's say if we, if we go to MPF instance VM0, you should be able to log in. So now I'm in the, I'm in the virtual machine, MPI instance 0, VM0, okay? Now over there, we already installed the uh, MRPG2 world for you. So I also have some commands. For example, if you want to play with it, they say we want to run internal inter VM communication, uh, OSU latency. This is the command we are, uh, we, we are going to run. So like I mentioned earlier, in order to get a better performance, I we, you, you have to enable IVishman like this, M M2, uh, vert use IVishman equals one, and then you run. So with this, you, you can see this performance is really good. This is two process across two virtual machines. You are able to, to get a 0 0.2 microsecond for small message. Okay, this is really just like your native environment, right? right? And then if, we, if, you, if you don't enable the Eichmann, whatever optimization I mentioned earlier, you just put zero, you will see that performance becomes 1.3, okay? So which means, and also for large message, it becomes like how, how much? 800, but earlier the performance is 400. That's like a 50% improvement, right? And what is the default value of the Default, sorry, what? Default value of this variable? 
Yeah, the default, the default is one, so we just want to let you use it. But I, I'm just explicitly letting you know, okay, this, this variable is important, okay? So this is the uh, real demo. You can also run bindwise. For example, if you run bindwise here, this is the zero, which means it's disabled. Just like you run default lemma p2 in the virtual machine environment. You only get a maximally 5,370, uh, right? Now let me show you if, you if you use one, what happens? You can, you can double your bandwidth, Ten, right? 10K, 10 easily. So with this, you can see that, okay, with our optimization, even in the virtual machine environment, you're able to get the near native performance. That's pretty uh, promising for uh, running your jobs in HPC Cloud. So with that, I don't want to show some other uh, examples. Uh, if you have an account in uh, Chameleon, so uh, please feel free to try. Uh, otherwise, if you have interest, we can uh, work with you to deploy our stack in your environment. Another thing is we also work with uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, hopefully in the nearest future, our stack will be available there. So if you have accounts on Azure, you should be able to use our solution as well. So the next steps for MRP2 world is that, so these days, whatever I, I present is still purely focused on the uh, networking side. But uh, in the other, on the other front, there's a lot of requirements on the uh, GP, GPU and the KNL, OmniPulse, those kind of things. So in the future, we are trying to uh, explore other design op opportunities and, and also some more challenges in, in, in those sites. And also some of these will, uh, so far we are not released yet. For example, the virtual machine migration support currently is not released yet. We are going to do that also. So with this, let me conclude the, this demo and the tutorial. So first of all, we, are, we want to give you some important messages. Uh, is HPC Cloud gives you a lot of opportunities but the only thing is you may worry about their performance. But actually, with, with some optimized designs, like uh, whatever I proposed here, we proposed in our image 2 library, we actually can bring your performance very close to the near lady, uh, very close to the per uh, lady performance. And we support both the virtual machine environment and the container environment, even nested virtualization environment. Another important thing is these days, there's no SRV based uh, migration solution available, which is independent with driver, device, as well as uh, hypervisor and uh, uh, OS. But we have the solution, okay? We have the first solution available in the community, which can support your virtual machine migration inside, on top of SRV enabled in failure band clusters. And uh, uh, our library is available. It's all those performance I just showed is already public available. That's why you can get this performance in the community cloud. So try, free, free, feel free to try to download and, uh, and play with it. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know, uh, let us know and we will, we, we, uh, we will help you. Okay, for future release, we are trying to support the, uh, like a SNRN, make the SNRN available, and uh, make the migration uh, com component available, and also we are trying to support the GPGPU and the KNL, those kind of environment. With this, thank you a lot.